All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa Nova Conversations. I am Massimo Pilucci, your host from the City College of New York, and my co-host is Rob Coulter from the University of Wyoming. Rob is saying that it was really damn cold there, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's about 10 degrees below zero wind chills here in Laramie, Wyoming, so that's, but that's not that cold for <laughs> no not, not for a story that's for sure <laughs> that's right all right before we actually introduce today's topic and and uh, and guest uh, let me remind you that the next episode of the store nova conversations will take place on sunday november 15 at 1 p.m eastern time we will talk about stoicism and politics since uh, at that by that point m maybe we'll have a new president or not um, maybe this is still going to be a democracy or not uh, we have no idea what's going to happen so stoicism and politics seems like a very good uh, a good topic what does stoicism tell us about politics if anything does it commit us to be um, you know to endorse the views of any political party or systems or so, so on and so that's going to be an interesting conversation with Rob that I'm, I'm looking forward to it. If you want to register for that event, go to meetup.com and look for Stoa Nova. And if you want to uh, watch past episodes of the Stoa Nova conversations, you go to Vmail and search for the Stoa Nova channel, or you wait until uh, we post this, uh, uh, this, the current video, and then you'll see the uh, link to everything else we've done so far. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into uh, today's uh, topic. This is where our guest is William Stevens, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, Marcus Aurelius. William, welcome. You are the, the author of one of my favorite books on Marcus Aurelius. And that Thank is... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> that is Marcus I wrote it just for you. I wrote it just for you, my friend. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that, that would be Marcus Aurelius, A Guide for the Perplexed. And I know that that is a series uh, that I think Bloomsbury puts out, right? The, the Guide for the Perplexed. But um, I really enjoyed it. When I, when I picked it up, I said, all right, this is, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> that's right. Uh, this is one of, in my mind, actually, it is one of the best, if not the best books for a general public about Marcus Aurelius. Um, and uh, so thanks for- That's high for praise. Me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rob, do you want to start with grilling William? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. I'd be glad to. Nice to meet you, by the way. And uh, okay. before you start, Rob, can I just say already, uh, I appreciate your generosity in sending the, the sub- uh, zero temperatures my way in eastern Nebraska because all of that cold air is coming coming right is. down our throat here in eastern yeah. Nebraska. So, well, you know, we just prepare the best we can, and as we say in Wyoming, there's no bad weather, only bad gear choices. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I too really enjoyed the book. It's uh, a really careful study of a lot of aspects of Marcus Aurelius that don't get touched on near as often as I, I'd like. But um, one question I'd like to start with is some of the background to Marcus Aurelius that you that you go into a good bit of detail about. And in particular, I'd like to hear more about, um, if you could, expand a little bit on um, the connections between Marcus Aurelius in particular and his debts to, say, Heraclitus, the notion of logos, um, which is really, I think, really neatly fleshed out in your book, but I think maybe everybody would like to hear a little more about that too. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, of course, Heraclitus was very influential throughout the Stoa, but I think he, he had kind of varying levels of impact on different late period Stoics. So you don't see Seneca talking a lot about Heraclitus. You certainly don't see Epictetus talking a lot about Heraclitus might mention him in passing as a wise man. But Marcus really seems to have been exercised a lot by Heraclitus's ontology. Um, Marcus does a good job in the meditations of picking images which are symbolic of the cosmos, the world order. And he really features Heraclitus's symbols of fire the Lagos is fire, um, certainly the moving river, right? And the kind of balance of give and take, the trading off of elements from one to the next, the recycling of all natural bodies, you know, through the process of death and decomposition 
and then new birth, aging, and then death again. So these cyclical processes that Heraclitus features in his fragments. And the fire imagery, very powerful in, in Marcus, right? Marcus likens the human spirit or the human character that Stoics ought to strive to achieve as this burning conflagration, this fire that no matter what objects you throw on it, they are converted into fuel that then burns the fire even stronger. And so again, you've got this Heraclitean notion of an exchange of wood to flame, and then that converts to light and heat and smoke and embers. And this is characteristic of the, the rhyme and reason, right? The logos that Heraclitus sees at work in the universe. And Marcus very much embraces that from his Stoic providential perspective, right? He sees that kind of unitary, organized, intelligible operation um, as guiding our insights into the purposiveness, the regularity, the, the, the cyclical balance and harmony um, that Marcus perceives in the universe. So you have that, and then you also have, in more subtle ways, Heraclitean themes, where Heraclitus says in one fragment, you know, one man is worth 10,000 if only he be best, right? So you've got the elitism, where you've got wisdom being of incomparable value compared to any of the things that non-Stoics typically covet. And for Marcus, again, that's, that resonates throughout the meditations, right? For him, if it's not virtue, if it's not this kind of sanity, right? Having, having your head on straight to see what change is and how change is just old hat, right? Life, death, politics, it always seems to be getting worse before it's getting better, if it gets better at all. Marcus's cosmic perspective, I really think, um, owes a, quite, a, quite a debt to Heraclitus's notion that if you're wise, if you're one of those wise folk, right, or even if you're not a wise person, you're not a sage, at least you can get that insight. And that separates you from people who are completely overwhelmed and obsessed with money, fame, power, self-gratification, ego, ego, right? that Marcus is going to just trash as utterly trivial. If it's not virtue, it's trash in Marcus's But, but Heraclitus was, however, also famously difficult to read, right? I mean, he, his nickname was actually The Obscure. Uh, yes. Later philosophers. And I think there is a bit in, um, I believe it's in Xenophon, uh, where Socrates is asked about Heraclitus. And he says, yeah, if I, I got the, the, the sort of the gist of it, but you know, if I actually, I don't have the time basically to get into the details because it's very difficult to read. It's, so this, this is this guy that was actually difficult for Socrates to read. Right. So confident and presumably he was reading Heraclitus's book. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. What, what we have are just tiny shreds of paper, these right. tiny fragments, right? Right. So how, how confident are we, uh, you know, our modern scholars that we are actually getting the gist at least of what Heraclitus was, was saying? Right. Well, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a medium in which philosophers thrive because we have license to <laughs> interpret for our own purposes. Right. <laughs> right. So, so we're, we're forced to indulge in interpretation, speculation, and, and, you know, creative understanding of the text that we do have. So um, in this, so again, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Marcus had, I mean, I don't know whether Marcus had a, a copy of Heraclitus's book during, during his lifetime. I don't even know, but certainly within the Stoic tradition, Heraclitus has been embraced as presenting a kind of ontological view, which resonates with the Stoics and the notion of this craftsman-like fire out of which things coalesce and, and the river analogy, right? You can't step into the same river twice. Marcus very much exercised with this notion of transience, temporality, um, impermanence. 
and what, what kind of wisdom that should inculcate in us if we understand that properly. So at least in interpreting Heraclitus in those ways, he puts Heraclitus to his own sort of philosophical use, I think. So one of the things that struck me as interesting in Heraclitus, and then as you say, the, the effect that he had on the Stoics, is that, so the way Heraclitus looks at things is what modern philosophers call uh, sometimes process metaphysics, uh, right? So as opposed to object-oriented metaphysics. So the world is not made of stable objects, it's made of processes. And sometimes we don't realize that there are processes just because they they occur at a too slow uh, or too fast of a pace compared to the ability of human beings to observe. You know, the typical example being a man- mountains. Mountains are not stable objects. They, they rise over time because of tectonic movements and they are raised over time because of erosion. But of course, during a lifetime of a human being, they hardly change at all, except for, you know, with, with few exceptions. So now, um, the reason I'm bringing that up is because normally we talk about the ethics, the stoic ethics as being, being very much relevant to you know today's uh you know society and that's that's why we're having these conversations that's why you know most people are interested in the ethics and in fact often we think that the logic is still holding up i mean even though there are there have been um, certainly of course advancements in logic especially uh from the late 19th century on compared to what the stoics had done in fact the stoic stoic logic is pretty much you know proposition logic is pretty much what we still use today in everyday yes. uh, applications so the, the the ethics is great the logic is still uh good enough the physics of course on the other hand is like well there's lots of stuff that has been superseded by modern science even modern metaphysics and i count myself among those that uh, often point that out However, this is not one of them, is it? Because um, uh, so there's this book that I read a few years ago called uh, Everything Must Go by uh, James Lettyman and uh, Don Ross. These are two modern metaphysicians. And they're taking on board everything that modern physics tells us about the foundational structure of the universe. And their conclusion is that what what modern physics tells us is that, in fact, there is no thing out there that even particles are not things in the way we tend to think of them. They're actually made of processes. And they right. push this so, to the point where they say that not, really nothing exists other than fields and, uh, uh, and, you know, which are dynamic processes. They're, not, they're certainly not objects. Yes. So if that's true, that sounds to me like that is one area of Stoic metaphysics, in fact, predating the Stoics, really, because we're going, we're going to the pre-Socratics, that really has survived pretty well to, to, to yes. today, right? Yes. And, and, and again, it depends on how comfortable we are being elastic in our interpretive framework. When we talk about things like pneuma, right? I mean, if we think of pneuma as a kind of pervading energy field, well, as you just mentioned, in contemporary physics, th- this is how we can describe how reality presents itself to us. And you mentioned mountains, but I just saw a a fascinating little story about starfish, right? So now we're talking about living living things. Although I wonder if one could argue from a Heraclitean perspective that anything that moves is alive in a way because it has that kind of self-motive power, right? But setting that that aside, with the time-lapse photography, you know, you, you watch starfish on the seafloor and they don't seem to be moving at all. Or if they're moving, they're only moving a tiny bit. But they actually locomote. They actually, over time, they move across the seafloor and across each other toward their food sources and so forth. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating time-lapse photography. So yeah, as you're saying, that does support this kind of processual white headian view of things are in flux. And I, I think this resonates very strongly with, with Marcus, even, even more so with Marcus than with the other Roman Stoics. You, you don't get this sort of thinking with our, our little discourses from Eusonius Rufus, right? No, <laughs> quite. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and Epictetus emphasizes the providence, but he, he's not into this. I mean, he, he does recognize the cyclical nature and he does talk about death and that's why it's not to be feared because it's natural and necessary and recycling. But Marcus seems to be particularly sensitive to these processes. Um, His example with beautiful things 
that people don't recognize their, the beauty in their necessity. Baking a loaf of bread and then the top of the bread starts to crack. Recognizing the cracks in the loaf of bread, which is ingredient to the process of baking. Recognizing those cracks, not as an imperfection, but as a feature of what it is to create bread, which is then going to be consumed by us, right? And made into fuel. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to this Heracleitean monism, as you were describing. And I think also this, this uh, supports a kind of monistic view that reality is basically unitary, it's singular in contrast to the atoms, right? The billiard balls bouncing together, right? right? Infinite number and infinite void. Marcus doesn't go for that. I mean, that, that might be, you know, he, he considers that as a metaphysical possibility, but he doesn't seem to think it's, it's like the kind of teleological purposive orientation that he thinks is especially valuable. That's great. Um, and, and leads me to something I'd like to push you on a little bit with regard to that. Um, you seem to read the sort of famous gods or a God or Adams passages as the contrast between holism and pluralism. Um, and I wondered if you could maybe articulate that a little bit more, how you get the holism, tie that in with the process stuff. Um, that you were just mentioning in a little more explicitly. And then I wonder if you could say how, uh, how you see the implications of, of that dispute that seems to be going on in some passages of Marcus and what he takes that to mean for the uh, ethics. Right. So um, Marcus, uh, his method is very, as metaphysicians would call it, very myriological. He practices myriology. Miros is Greek for, for part, right? So examining a whole and then literally analyzing it, right? Analysis is to break down into parts. So when you take a whole and you analyze it and you break it down into its constituent parts, its component parts, then you understand the relationship between the whole and the part, the whole and its parts of that particular object. Marcus does this with everything. He does it with the entire cosmos. The cosmos, nature, the world, is composed of mountains and continents and planets and stars, but on, on Earth, myriad species. So human beings, ants, bees, dogs, cats, cows, sheep, fish, birds, right? And they're all busily doing their thing, right? This is Marcus's teleological view. They're all doing their job. If you watch ants scurrying on the anthill, bees working the hive, these are examples of cooperativeness, right? Cooperation, which Marcus thinks human beings must also perform in order to do our job. So this is at the kind of ecological, right? And in terms of the biosphere, you've got the one biosphere, right? And you've got the many, many different species with countless number, numbers of specimens, individual organisms within each species. And of course, Marcus didn't know presumably that there were millions, but would he be surprised by that? Who knows, right? We're still cataloging species. So then within the human community, right? He takes that image of the bees in the hive. You've got the hive. What doesn't harm the hive doesn't harm the bee. So this is his communitarianism, right? Each part contributing to the overall good. And we've got the same kind of holism and myriology at work with the human body, right? We've got all of these different cells and our cells are constantly being replaced. So here's the Heraclitean notion of the only thing that doesn't change is that there's always change. Everything is always changing and that's the one constant, Lagos. Lagos gets that. So we replacing, we're replacing our, our cells and our, and our body all the time over years, right? sloughing off skin over what, six, seven years time, replacing it with new skin. And at the level of organs, if we get our foot infected by stepping on sharp objects, thorns, gravel, whatever it is, and we cut our feet and we get an infection, what's the relationship of part to whole? Well, the foot exists for the sake of the body, not the other way around. 
And so if the body gets infected and the only way to save the whole body is amputation, then you amputate the foot. And then it doesn't serve the purpose of a foot anymore. And so it isn't a foot anymore. It's just a chunk of meat that used to be attached to a living organism. Yeah, that's, that, is, that makes a lot of sense. But in the book, at some point, I think, if I remember correctly, I should have checked my notes, actually. But if I remember correctly, um, you, you go into these uh, several examples in which Marcus Aurelius, in particular, although he's not doing there anything that earlier Stoics, including Zeno himself, didn't do, uh, is coming close, if not the, out, the outright commits a logical fallacy known as the fallacy of composition. That, it, that is, it looks at the properties of parts and, and infers the, from those the properties of the, of the whole or vice versa. And that, the, that kind of stuff actually we recognize today just doesn't follow, right? The, the classic, the, the obvious example would be there are uh, intelligent organisms in the universe, therefore the universe itself is intelligent. Well, no. Uh, unless you mean that in the trivial way that, you know, I'm calling the universe intelligent because there are intelligent beings in it. Okay, fine. Then, then it's okay. But it's not a property of the universe as a whole. How, how does that work out with, with Marcus? Right. So the thing about the fallacy of composition and division is you're right that sometimes they're fallacies. Other times they're not. It really depends on the particular argument, right? So take, take the cells of the body example. The cells of a human body are physical. Therefore, the body as a whole is physical. Does that commit the fallacy of No, right. In that case, no, it no. doesn't. No, in that case, no, it doesn't, doesn't right? Mm -hmm. But then if we say, well, my, my shirt is black, therefore, the atoms that compose, that make up my shirt are black, that would be the fallacy of division, right? right? So, so this is why I, you know, I, in the book, I, I, I kind of hedge on that because it, it really seems to me we have to look at each argument and, and be careful in discerning whether we think it's a fallacious inference or not. And his example of the bees in the hive, you know, that, that's a particularly good one, right? And clearly it's bad for the bee. If the bee on its journey collecting, collecting nectar if, he, if it were to suffer damage, get injured, or even get killed, would that be bad for the hive as a whole? Well, the hive is going to be resilient enough that if it loses one drone, one worker bee, it's, it's going to be okay. But clearly, from the point of view of the individual bee, that's a bad thing. And so, I mean, I don't know, just to anticipate your discussion next week in the political context, you know, we you know, contemporary, you know, Americans in the West, you know, we, we think that individuals do have rights. This is a longstanding tradition. But, you know, given, given, you know, my own study of virtue ethics, this notion of individual rights really kind of fragments the community and understanding its, its responsibilities, what, what makes for a thriving community in ways that I think that maybe some figures like Marcus and more organic thinkers that at least reflect on the relationship of living holes and parts might not. Uh, so your point about the universe is well taken, right? I mean, we could, we could resist or be quite skeptical that the cosmos as a whole is an intelligent being. The ancient Stoics did believe that, of course. Yes, they did, right. They yeah. thought it was a living animal. Right. Um, but, but again, uh, if we look at the concept of a biosphere, right, this shell of living, of this network of living organisms that, that encases the earth, right, going up a couple miles from the surface, that kind of monistic understanding of life on earth and earth as a kind of living planet, right, that has some some kind of credence and resonance with some stoic ideas. It does, uh, although so let's stay there for just a second, um, if if you don't mind. Uh, it does, but as a biologist, for instance, I myself tend to be pretty skeptical of the notion of a sort of a, what is sometimes referred to as the Gaia hypothesis, and sure. precisely for that reason, right? That um, uh, yes, the Earth, the Earth biosphere is a complex dynamic process, set of processes. Heraclitus is absolutely right there. There's no question about it. Um, however, generally speaking, we have little difficulty, you know, 
of dividing up those processes in the ones that we think are biological and the ones that we think are not biological. Uh, yes, there are situations where that division is not quite that as neat as, as, as it might be, uh, or we may want it to be, but you know, Photosynthesis is clearly a biological process. Uh, tectonic movements are clearly not a biological process and so on and so forth, right? We could, we could go on from, that, for, from there. So uh, when the Stoics, you're right, that of course this, this, the ancient Stoics did uh, think of the universe as, as, uh, at, at large as a living organism. And they do several times, sometimes, for instance, I just reread recently Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods. And in book two, he actually presents several arguments that the, the ancient Stoics are uh, going back all the way to Zeno, Cleantus, and Chrysippus. Uh, he presents several arguments that the ancient Stoics deploy to that, to that effect. Some of those arguments are, in a sense, a uh, you know, composition kind of arguments. But, but they also had other arguments which we may or may not today think of as good ones, like the, the classic example is an argument from design, which you actually find also in Epictetus, in the discourses, it basically yes. sets up the, the, an argument, what we call an argument from design. Now, nowadays, argument from designs don't fly very well, not, not right. after David Hume and, and Charles Darwin. But at the time, uh, quite honestly, I would have been on the side of the Stoics and not the Epicureans <laughs> because it was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me right. you know, on the basis of what I know. So uh, my point being, I guess, is, is that, that um, uh, one way, to, going back to Marcus, one way to discriminate when the argument uh, based on, a, on analysis of, of parts of whole relationships may or may not be fallacious is, well, do, what, else, what, what else are you bringing to the, to the table? Why do you think that it's, it's, you can make that inference from the parts to the whole or, or vice versa? And if you have additional arguments, then that's actually, uh, that reinforces your point. If, you, if your only argument is one of composition, then it then might be shaky. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, for, for, for Marcus, uh, often I think the muriological arguments are aimed at reinforcing his, um, his view, if, if, it's, if it's not virtue, it's junk, as I call it in the book, right? <laughs> and even that, you know, have to qualify a little bit because he does have an appreciation for these natural processes um, that he's, that he has an, he has a, an aesthetic sensitivity to them. So when he sees the, the olives hanging, that the, the blush of, of ripeness on the olives that are about to fall from the tree, when he sees the flecks of foam on the boar's mouth or the wrinkled furrowed brow of the lion, right? Things that people might react to and says, oh, that, that's gross or that looks ugly or that's scary and it makes the you know, hair of the hackle stand up. For Marcus, again, these are features of the intricate, intricate interconnectedness of living animals, plants, species on Earth. And, and so again, yeah, we, we don't have to go as far as the Gaia hypothesis as contemporary Stoics interpreting that. Um, and so those things, again, point for Marcus toward a providential view. For us, they might not, but... Um, I think that, again, his main emphasis is to emphasize that these transient things that people get all worked up about, fearing lions, thinking about how much money they're going to make from their olive press, right, that sort of thing, it, it just, it's trivialized and de-glamorized by him in, co in contrast to virtue, which is something that, what, can't be broken down into trivial parts. Virtue does not admit of that kind of dissection like like the beautiful melody, right? The, the, the song as a whole, the melody as a whole is beautiful. What is a melody composed of? It's composed of ding, ding, ding. Yep. Individual notes that you don't get all worked up about. They don't move you, the individual notes, right? right. Um, but you can't do that with virtue. You can't break it down that way. So uh, I, I think that kind of de-glamorization strategy of Marcus's is rehearsed again and again in the meditations and is a useful one, right, for us too, with our contemporary therapies. Yeah. So 
that brings me actually to a, a little bit of a general question based on something you point out uh, in, in the book that, I, that struck me as exactly right, but I'd like you to elaborate on it. That is, Marcus is often considered not really a philosopher, right? The meditations were just his personal diary. And, you know, he was influenced by all these other people that he quotes extensively from Plato to, to Epictetus. It's, it's like, you know, what, what has he contributed? You know, it's, he's not really a philosopher. But you actually make a point that no, he's a much better philosopher than most people realize, right? Oh, absolutely. Good grief, right? So that would be to argue if you don't teach philosophy, then you're not a philosopher. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculous, right. right? I mean, so so Epictetus, Musonius Rufus, you know, they were very much, they were professional teachers, if you will, right? Professional Stoic teachers. But Seneca wasn't really ever a teacher. I mean, he tutored Nero, yeah. Not very successfully, right? <laughs> In terms of no, moral definitely formation, not. <laughs> definitely not, right? Um, but, and Seneca had different professions, but no one's going to, who would challenge that Seneca's a philosopher? No, good grief. Marcus, and, and this, is, this is what's one thing that's so remarkable, maybe the most remarkable things about the meditations. And we, and we call it meditations. In my book, as you know, I argue that it's really misleading for philosophers to, to really be too comfortable labeling his writings, Marcus's writings, the meditations, because of course it inevitably it, it, uh, uh, connotes or, or brings to mind Descartes and what he's doing, not in right. the discourse on method, but in his meditations. This is not what Marcus is doing. So in my book, as you know, I argue that uh, a less distorting way to refer to the writings would be the memoranda. These are things that Marcus is rehearsing to remember. He frequently says, bear in mind, don't forget, keep in mind, right? Recall that. And he's doing that because his job, his full-time job, right? Once he becomes co-emperor and then emperor after that is to run the empire. So he doesn't have the opportunity, even if he wanted to, to be a Stoic teacher. But were it not for the fact that these writings were preserved for us, we would not have had any idea how deeply and energetically philosophical a thinker that Marcus was. He clearly is a philosopher. He's clearly thinking in ontological terms. In his, he offers a philosophy of time, a philosophy of change. We've already talked about his mere reology. He, he has, you know, in passing comments about communitarianism and even suggestive comments about politics. He has a kind of aesthetic take on things. Good grief. What, what areas, what about epistemology? What can be known, right? So even a few passages. And again, he did not write these writings for anyone to read, so far as we can tell. And yet we can interpret them and we can discern all of these different philosophical kinds of arguments that he gives. I mean, when I teach this stuff to my students, I reconstruct one argument after the next, after the next, and they're just chock full. The memoranda are chock full of these. Um, and that's why it is so interesting to look and look at the particular arguments and see, is he committing a fallacy of composition here? Well, let's look at that. Let's discuss that. Is this a fallacy of division or is this a cogent argument, right? with his analogical reasoning. So yeah, I, I, I think it's quite clear that Marcus was a philosopher and we have ample evidence of that in his writings. That's great. Um, yeah, I don't think that's emphasized enough. I, um, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think I was inclined to agree with you before I read your book and then you've convinced me even further. So um, yeah, I wanted to uh, talk a little more about some stuff that we've kind of hinted at. But um, the relationship between what, what Marcus says about um, the stuff we've been talking about and his political views, as you pointed out multiple times, he's, of course, very active politically, kind of has to be. Um, and then, you know, if, if you wanted to, you make connections between the, the virtue of justice and um, connections between ideas of reverence and blasphemy in the book. And um, if you could articulate that a little bit, um, I think that would be great. And um, also it might be some stuff we could steal for our next conversation. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so, so, you know, famously the Stoics have uh, 
are, are committed to the, the unity of virtue thesis, that the virtues are interentailing. And so for the Stoics, virtue is a physical tautness. It is a physical tone of the soul, which is a physical thing inside the body, which is another physical thing. And so what they call virtue or wisdom is that one unitary psychological state, that one unitary mental state, and the different virtues uh, that we name are simply applications of that one mental mindset, that one frame of understanding, as applied to different spheres or provinces of human life and human activity. So wisdom, knowing what's good, what's bad, and what's indifferent. Knowledge, understanding of those things. Justice then is wisdom as it applies to what people deserve, right? And what they ought to be doing and what they ought to get in response, what, what should be done, to what they should receive uh, because of their actions. So for Marcus, as we saw, given his emphasis on communitarianism and his view that all beings, not just humans, but all beings have their own tasks to perform, all animals do. Um, human beings, we have our tasks to perform. We have our roles that we are to fulfill. So justice for us is following Plato's Republic definition, right? Minding your own business, taking care of your stuff, right? Doing your job, fulfilling all of your different social roles, your different civic roles, your different familial roles, your different professional roles, in terms of your occupation and your own personal roles, right? All your different associations and activities, all the different hats that we wear. So for Marcus, justice is doing your job as part of the larger community, contributing to humanity by doing your tasks, doing your agenda. Yeah. Each day. That that is that is an interesting way of i think this, this not just marcus way but the stoic way uh, <coughs> or, or I, I i guess it even i will go even broader the ancient greek roman way of looking at justice is very different from what people think today of as justice right so today we we think of in terms of philosophy john rawls the theory of justice right so we we, we think of high level top down uh overarching universal theories that's what we mean by by justice, right? But in fact, justice for the ancient was, as you pointed out, a virtue. And, and it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a character tendency. It's a way of behaving in a certain, in a, in a certain way. And, and therefore, from the Stoic perspective, justice in the way, I guess, we understand it comes from the bottom up, not from the top down, right? So Right. Well said. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I've, I've had many debates with my Marxist colleagues at Creighton <laughs> in the philosophy department, because for them, you know, justice is first and foremost, and maybe perhaps um, almost exclusively an institutional property. It's a property of institutions. So social justice is a property of mass collectives, right? right. As opposed to it's a personal trait, it's a character trait, right? So, so yeah, Marcus doesn't have this kind of Rawlsian view of justice, which helps, I think, explain why, um, uh, other than a few comments by Seneca that you should treat your slaves kindly because they are human beings after all, other than a few comments like that in Seneca, my students are always wondering, well, why didn't the Stoics militate for abolishing slavery? Right? Epictetus, who was a slave and learned Stoicism as a slave and only later earned his freedom, even he never argues about abolishing slavery as an institution. Marcus doesn't even talk about that in the memoranda, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a feature of the universe. Of course, there are going to pe be people who have more political power and those who have less. So it doesn't right. even occur to them that slavery is by nature unjust and as an institution must be abolished and so forth. Because yeah. following Epictetus, we've got a very different notion of what slavery counts as for him. Um, and, and Marcus doesn't, doesn't spend a lot of time talking. Although there is, there is uh, I want to actually move on to a different topic in a second, but th there are a couple of exceptions, I guess, to that general 
rule, if it is a rule. One is there is a fragment in, in, uh, from Zeno where apparently in the Republic says that, that uh, uh, slavery is, e is an evil. Um, and it's not clear whether that actually was meant as a sort of general uh, critique of the institution or not. Certainly in the ideal Stoic society, there will be no slavery because there will be all, uh, you know, sages going around. So right, right. No reason, right. Um, the other exception that I guess that I, not, not to the concept of slavery, but the, to this notion that the Stoics um, focus on their own virtue as opposed to sort of some kind of systemic problems is uh, the famous protracted episode of the so-called Stoic opposition. The, these were um, senators and philosophers, in fact, who were opposed to what they saw as the tyranny of uh, Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian. In fact, if you want to go even earlier than that, you know, Cato's own Cato the Younger's own, you know, picking up arms against Julius Caesar because he saw it as a tyrant, as a tyrant. So there is an issue, there is some, some notion there that if there is something at a systemic level that it's not working well, you do need to work on to, to fix it, even to the point of actually picking up arms. In other words, you know, violent revolution. Yes, but, but notice that even then, that's the decision of, of an individual person. So, yes. so if you value justice, if you value virtue above all else, as Stoics right. do, and you value virtue as one application of your wise and virtuous understanding of you know, how to live, then that's going to naturally manifest itself in your actions. Right. And so you're going to oppose unjust behavior wherever you encounter it. Whether it's whether it's a shopkeeper cheating you out of you know uh, you know shortchanging you or something as extremely dangerous as dealing with an autocrat dealing with the tyrant yeah, exactly. like like Emperor Trump I mean uh, <laughs> sorry uh, yeah right sorry that one. sorry that metal one. slip there okay uh, yeah, since, absolutely yeah since we're talking about Marcus and you're reading a book about him I can't. Uh, help but asking well I could help myself but I'd like to ask you uh, what did you think of Gladiator the movie and particularly you think that the, 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 the if you've seen it I assume you've seen it um, and in particular well, you know I've seen it it's in the appendix of my book oh that's right see uh, there you go <laughs> what there you are you go. talking about my it's it's I've my dementia it man of times. it's my I, dementia, I teach man. it in my stoicism class yeah there you go yes, so I'm you particularly with the movie <laughs> Yes, then we are particularly well positioned. Forget, for, forgive my dementia. So, um, <laughs> think of Maximus as kind of a stoic in training. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's what I argue. So, so I wrote a piece on Maximus long ago um, as uh, of a stoic figure. It's a story about his development and advancement, his coming to understand. Um, how he fits in the world and, and actually his own challenges to justice. This is a nice segue, right? How does Maximus understand um, uh, what he owes Rome after having been stripped of his status as a general, uh, then he be, you know, and, and, and then he's to be executed, but he focuses on what's up to him and he defeats the uh, the Praetorian guards who are about to behead him, um, and he kills them, and then he's fleeing, and he rushes back to Spain to try to save his family, but he doesn't get there in time, and his wife and his son have been butchered and crucified and burned and terrible things, and he just collapses, right? He, he, he's, he's so victimized by injustice that he becomes a broken, he becomes a broken man. But in my initial paper about, um, uh, about Maximus and Gladiator, I have to say, I have to give a shout out to uh, my, my, my friend and yours, John Sellers, because John wrote a very interesting piece on stoicism in films. And he rightly took issue with aspects of my earlier paper on Maximus becoming a kind of stoic hero um, in Gladiator. And that gave me the opportunity. And John argues that um, it's actually Proximo who says things which indicate a much more stoic understanding about death and transience and fame. And John's piece was really very good. And so that 
kind of rocked me a little bit out of my dogmatic slumber in, you know, uh, praising uh, uh, the, the, the strengths that I saw in, in Maximus's development. And so I had to do a much more thorough job of revamping that paper. And so it's that revised paper, which is the appendix of my Marcus book. But stubborn as I am, as academics often are, I dug in my heels and decided to keep arguing for my original thesis. I just tried to do a better job of it. And then I used Proximo and contrast to poke some holes in John's argument. Um, but in any case, Maximus has all sorts of flaws. He does seem to be kind of petulant. He, he, he does not respond at all as a Stoic in uh, sort of understanding himself to be a victim of injustice. But this is the beginning of his Stoic education, or so I argue, as he then um, initially is just sort of indifferent and complacent. He's taken as a slave and he refuses to fight when he's being rated on how good a gladiator he's going to be. Um, the Oliver Reed character Proximo says, you know, his time will come. You don't need to beat him up anymore. And slowly, Maximus's virtues, not only his martial valor, but his discipline come back to him after he scrapes off with a sharp stone the SPQR tattoo from his shoulder, right? He, he denies his identity as a Roman soldier by and, rec and embraces his new role in a very stoic way, right? As Epictetus would say in the Enchiridion 17, right? He embraces his new role now as a gladiator and gladiators are slaves. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna be a slave. I'm gonna do a good job being a slave. I'm gonna be a good gladiator, right? And then it, his, his skills in leadership that he'd never lost come back and he organizes the fellow, his fellow gladiators and he starts to recognize that, hey, you know, it's enough, it's enough for, I've, I've, I've cried in my soup enough. My watery gruel has enough tears in it. I got to get back in the game here. Who's the guy who did, who did injustice to me, right? Instead of thinking of himself as a victim, then he starts to see um, Joaquin Phoenix's character, Commodus, the emperor, he's a tyrant, right? He's an unjust guy. And he's doing all sorts of harm, not just having murdered my wife and son, but he's a tyrant for all of Rome. He's a, a cancer that has to be surgically removed from the body of the Roman politic. So he's got to come down. And then he meets, he, and then the, the plot unfolds and he meets with um, Commodus's sister who he had a relationship with long ago before he got married and all the rest. And he meets with Derek Jacoby's character, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Gracchus, right, if I'm remembering right, um, and they plot, and they, they plot to take, to take Commodus down, um, and he recognizes that, yeah, it's not just vengeance, although there is some of that, <laughs> he right. is going to get his vengeance to the end, but he recognizes that it's bad for all Romans, for Commodus to rule, it's unjust, he's an unjust tyrant, he has to be removed, he's the man to do it with some help. So we are getting close to the hour. Um, I think that uh, Rob is going to ask you one more question, and then hopefully we're going to have a few minutes for Q&A. If people right. are interested in asking questions, I see already uh, one hand up, but raise your virtual hand, not the physical one, because I can't see everyone. Uh, so yeah. Rob, you're, you're, you have the last question before the Q&A. Yeah, um, great. I really wanted to uh, say I appreciated all, all the time you've given us to ask uh, to answer a lot of these questions and stuff but it's my understanding you're working on a new book on Epictetus um, could you give us a little bit of uh, highlights of that or or general direction you're going or something like that what are appetites I'm happy to Rob thank you actually I have two books on Epictetus that I'm working on one of them I'm co-authoring with my colleague Scott Aiken at Vanderbilt University he and I are writing a new commentary on Epictetus's Enchiridion. Nice. I've written the tra a new translation, and he and I are writing commentaries on each of the chapters of the handbook, and that's going to be published uh, by Bloomsbury. We hope in 2022. Uh, that's the, our our target for that project. So that's the co-authored book on Epictetus's handbook. A much larger project, a much longer and more slowly developing project over years has been my book on Epictetus, a monograph, Stoic Lessons in Liberation, Epictetus as Educator. Mm -hmm. 
So what I'm doing in that book is examining Epictetus's pedagogical strategies. There are seven different themes uh, that he practices, that he repeats in the discourses um, and the Enchiridion. And so what I do in that book is I focus on seven different lessons, as I call them, that he tries to impart to his students. So after an introductory chapter laying out the relationship between uh, Musonius Rufus, Epictetus's teacher, and Epictetus, and then his student, Arian, who's the author of uh, the Discourses in the Handbook, I've got seven other chapters. So it's an eight chapter book. The first, uh, the first theme I examine is the interrelationship between freedom, integrity, self-respect, and happiness. Nice. Uh, in the next chapter, I examine, I contrast real versus fake tragedy with real versus fake heroism. He extols Socrates as his favorite hero in the discourses, and he debunks the notion of classic Homeric heroes like Achilles or Agamemnon as heroes. Uh, Epictetus has a conditioned view uh, of people like Odysseus, for example, as candidates for heroes. Hercules, Heracles, definitely a hero, but Socrates and Diogenes, of course, the cynic, are his biggest heroes. Um, so I talk about tragedy and heroism in that chapter. I have a chapter on the instructive roles that animals play in Stoic education. And I trace these. Epictetus has tons of these, but you also find them in Seneca. You also find them in Musonius Rufus. Um, and in an indirect way, Marcus has a couple texts about that. So that's a, 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 a chapter that I'd previously, or a book, paper that I'd previously published that I'm um, fitting into this book structure as well. I also have a chapter on athleticism, sport and game playing as analogies for striving to become virtuous, exercising the mind, becoming a kind of stoic athlete of the mind in contrast to an athlete of the body. Um, I have a chapter on place, time, and progress in the journey to self-realization in Epictetus, his notion of travel and providence. Um, and then also another previously published paper on death, how to live with death, fearlessly and how to exit life fearlessly. Epictetus' thanatology, as I call it, is account of death. And then the last chapter is how teaching wisdom is a vital means for the Stoic sage to love others. So the relationship between love for the Stoic sage and teaching, pedagogy, which is what Epictetus dedicated his life to, right? So those are the eight chapters that, that I rough out in the Stoic Lessons and Liberation book. Wow, that sounds super interesting. <laughs> that sounds super interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Oh, uh, I'd like to get it finished one day. I really would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the first step, I, I guess. All right, we have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. The first one in line is Scott. Uh, Scott, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, Rob. As always, William, great to collide with you and your work. My question is very practical. Um, for those of us that are amateur students of Stoicism, not taking it from an academic point of view, what are the what are your recommended sources for meditations, the fragments of Heraclitus and Epictetus? You mean the texts? Which which translations? Yeah. Oh well, um, gosh, the, uh, the meditations in particular has has dozens of translations. Lots of people, different people, have translated it. And I think it's very instructive when you're reading Marcus to actually read several different translations because many of Marcus's texts are very uh, telegrammatic. They're very brief. And so they, they, by their very nature, they're very kind of open textured when it comes to interpreting them. Um, I can tell you that uh, the translation that I require when I teach Marcus to my students is this Gregory Hayes translation in the modern library. I found that to be quite nice. Um, but gosh, I mean, uh, there, there's the Oxford classical text, uh, Wordsworth classics. This is uh, Chris Gill and Robin Hart, as I recall. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did a book review of this when it came out. Um, so, uh, I, I think generally the more recent a translation 
they tend to be better than ones that are 50, 60, 80 years old, right? But for Marcus, yeah, read a couple different ones. I, any of those three, I think, would be would be fine. Um, for Epictetus, um, I've been using the uh, the Oxford. Whoops, I've been using uh, the Oxford World Classics. That's uh, a recent translation. This is again Gill and uh, Christopher Gill and Robin Hard. Um, uh, but that said, um, I have to say I, I particularly like the kind of translation style that Robert Dobbin has. Um, he, he really, he, he will take some liberties with the Greek, but this is the Penguin edition. Um, the, the shortcoming of this edition is that it is just selected writings. Right. He has all of book one, most of book two, some of book three, and only a tiny bit of book four, and then all of the, all of the handbook. But Dobbin's translation, he's, he's a very graceful translator. He really makes Epictetus very immediate, I think. Um, for a complete edition, yeah, you can't go wrong with the Oxford. And actually, uh, one thing I can report is that uh, Robin Waterfield, I just found out recently, is doing a new translation. Do you know this, Rob? Robin Waterfield is doing a new translation of Epictetus for, I think, University of Chicago Press. That sounds right. So looking forward to that. I mean, Waterfield, again, is, is a very kind of fluent translator. So he's going to, I expect, it'll be a very readable version of Epictetus. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to see um, uh, what that's like. Um, and then you got your, the latest uh, translation of Musonius Rufus is this nice edition by Yale University Press. Um, this is, uh, this is Cora Lutz, um, translation of Musonius Rufus, hardback. I don't think it's available in paperback yet, Scott, but, um, uh, I, and I haven't even looked at this yet. I, I, I know the Lutz translation, but this is now available. And um, I believe there is going to be a new translation of Musonius Rufus's uh, lectures and sayings, uh, perhaps by Penguin. I believe there was a graduate student of John Sellers who was going to be doing this. Um, that's the last I had heard. I don't know if Massimo can confirm that, but uh, nice to have an accessible version of, uh, of Musonius Rufus. Yeah, actually, and then Seneca, is that right? Yes, I think that's right. I, I heard uh, John mentioning that very recently. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then for Seneca, well, the the University of Chicago um, translations of yeah. Seneca are quite good. Yeah. There, there's also an affordable one um, in, uh, by uh, Peter Anderson. Uh, I commented on on that translation some years ago. It's a it's a less expensive version published by Hackett, and that's a selection of readings from Seneca. Yeah. Very nice. All right, we have a few more minutes and one more question. David, go ahead. Hi there, everyone. Um, uh, I have a question that is actually perhaps a lead in to uh, the next episode on uh, Stoicism and politics. So this is before the election takes place. And um, I read William's really excellent article on Stoic ethics on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And one of the things that he points out at the end is the harsh dichotomies that the early Stoics made, for example, between the wise person or the sage and everyone else. And uh, basically, if you weren't a sage, you were considered to be a fool or insane. And uh, the first question I really wanted to ask about that is, did that go back to the cynics? And uh, I did a bit of research over the past uh, couple of days and I, I, I discovered that it did. Um, so I'm not going to ask that question, but it strikes me as being kind of a false dichotomy uh, or a fallacy of the excluded middle. And I know Massimo has tried to uh, kind of like map out how you could make some kind of uh, sense out of this, which I'm not really sure that you can. Um, but if we apply this to uh, the current political situation, the Stoics basically believe that virtue was an all or nothing thing. And that's why the sage was uh, basically 
omniscient in a certain kind of sense, and everyone else was uh, foolish or insane or impious or whatever. And so what I'm noticing in the political campaign is that both candidates are actually um, lying about different issues. And for example, I saw a clip from uh, Trump's uh, rally in Pennsylvania the other day, and he was talking about how coal is clean. Well, uh, certainly I know that's not true, and I think everyone else knows that's not true either. But then Biden is saying that Trump is responsible for all 200,000 COVID-19 deaths in the United States, which uh, similarly no sane person could really take to be true. That's an out-and-out falsehood because regardless of what Trump did or whether the federal response was good about COVID-19, uh, there would have been a lot of dead people in the United States and perhaps as many as we've seen already. It seems to me that if we flash back in time that Cicero, uh, who was really you know, one of the greatest uh, orators of all time, would have, if he was running for an election, he would have made uh, speeches that were persuasive, but actually based on the truth. I, based on what I know of Cicero, I don't think he would have departed from that. And so to get to my question here, the question I have is, um, I think this view of the Stoics that you can be, I, I know Mas Massimo has a lot of criticisms of uh, the early Stoics and he thinks that Stoicism should be updated, but this is a place where I think it should be updated. And I think this view that you can be only totally virtuous or immersed in vice and a vicious person is, is actually false. And if that was true, how would you apply that to political reasoning? Because if uh, Trump and Biden are both telling lies, then they're both not virtuous. And they would be seen as being equivalent in terms of lacking virtue by the Stoics. And I'm wondering how you would reconcile that with the actual reality of the situation. So that's my thought. Right. You can all go Thank at you. it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to have William go at it, uh, except for pointing out one tiny thing, which is actually the Stoics themselves don't think that lying is always unvirtuous. Uh, both Epictetus and Seneca say that sometimes you have to pretend, uh, especially with people who are not Sto in Stoic training. Uh, you know, if somebody expects you to grieve externally, you should grieve, even though internally you shouldn't, uh, for instance. And that's, that's a form of lying, but it's a form of pro-social lying, as uh, actually modern psychologists point out. That is, it's something that you do because other people expect you uh, to do it and they, you want them to feel better. It's about them, not about you. But other than that little bit about the lying part, okay. uh, uh, William, you got a, a, you know, a few minutes to, to wrap it up and we'll, we'll see. So I'm, I'm curious, what do you think about it? Yes, well, a very good question. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I might take issue with you, Master. I'm not sure that I would, I would describe that as lying. There is a kind of duplicity or an outward versus inward, but we can set, set that aside. Um, uh, of course, the, the, the early Stoics did use an image to try to defend that harsh dichotomy. Namely, if you're in the ocean and your head is below the surface of the water, it doesn't matter whether you're two or three or six feet down or 10 or 50 fathoms below the surface of the water, you're gonna drown either way. And so that's the parallel to being foolish. Being a little bit foolish means you lack wisdom a little bit. That is, you're, 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 even if you're closer to virtue, you're still gonna drown when your head is below the surface of the water. You gotta get your head above the surface of the water to breathe. That said, um, I, I don't think that that harsh dichotomy was a stumbling block at all for any of the late Stoics. The Roman Stoics did not worry about, you know, sage versus fool. For them, look, we're all fools. So in terms of strict theoretical consistency, we can maintain that dichotomy and just say, look, there are no sages. Even the Stoics thought, well, maybe Socrates was pretty close, but Socrates, of course, came before Zeno even founded the damn Stoa, right? So if he was a wise person before there even was the concept of a Stoic sage, you know, who's to say? The important thing for us is that Stoicism helps us live better lives now, right? So if we recognize our own shortcomings, our own failures, our own foolishness, 
and we set as our target sagehood, wisdom, as a prescriptive ideal that we're probably never going to reach and maybe no one ever reached, it's still the case that the closer we get to that ideal, the happier we're going to be, the freer we're going to be, the less enslaved to the kind of desires that make us unhappy and worried and fearful and angry the, we're going to be, right? We're going to be happier as we make progress. So within the class of fools, since we're all fools, there are those of us that are working hard to make progress. And there are those of us that we could just call damn fools, right? Who aren't making any progress, don't have any interest in stoicism or philosophy in general, right? And who are just wallowing in their false beliefs and their negative emotions, their pathé of fear and envy and jealousy and resentment and greed and trepidation and all the rest. And then there are those of us who are slowly making progress by getting angry less often by experiencing anxiety less often because we're taking these stoic lessons to heart and we're applying them in our lives. So I right. just grant that we're all fools. Then what? Then what? What do we do about being fools? We try really hard to be less foolish. That's right. And we try to make progress little by little. All right. Thank you very much. We have gotten to the past the end, actually, the hour. That's okay. Um, fortunately, we don't have any strict uh, deadlines. Uh, let me just um, thank our, our guest, William Stevens, the author, among other things, of Marcus Aurelius, A Guide for the Perplexed, and a bunch of stuff coming up, apparently, about Epictetus at some point. William, it was a pleasure to have you here. Hopefully, we'll have you again, especially when your next books come out. Uh, let me also thank my partner in crime, Rob Coulter, uh, out there in the colds of Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> Bundling up. And uh, let me remind, uh, remind everyone that we will be back next month uh, in, uh, on Sunday, November 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll talk about stoicism and politics. What does stoicism tell us about modern politics, if anything? Not at all coincidentally, that will be a few days after the U.S. elections. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, viewers. Really enjoyed the opportunity. Thanks very much. I'd love to come back another time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And, Absolutely. Uh, everyone stay safe. <laughs>